Welcome again to another edition of the Southwest Climate Podcast, the mid-monsoon edition. Mike Crimmins. Hey, Zach. How's it going? It's going really well. I'm, I got to be honest, I'm exhausted. Um, <laughs> I am kind I of feel too. Like, I feel like I've watched Usain Bolt run 15 100-meter dashes back to back. That's what the I know. I, felt like. I think the, the Olympic kind of analogy is, is right on. It was like... <laughs> I watched so much the Olympics. I was like, okay, I'm good. I'm ready for it to be done. I'm not saying that about the monsoon. Like I'm not <laughs> ready for it to be done, but I'm also, also kind of like wondering what it will feel like when it's done. <laughs> Cause it, at this point, holy moly. I think I just going to say that I feel like this is a generational monsoon. I'm not sure. We'll have to wait how the second half is to actually say that it's the, uh, it's uh, a centennial, but I'm ready to say it's a generational right now. We don't get this. I have never got this since since I've been here, even 2017, which is, <laughs> as you know, my you're, I at least you're, make a reference to 2017. Your 20, then, yeah, your 2017 is so anemic compared to what we're dealing with right now. I mean, you're you're starting to see the. It's weird to see monsoon fatigue because I didn't think it actually existed, and you're starting to see. I'm sitting around Tucson. People are like, okay. Yeah, that, that's cool, but I, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, another storm. That's another yeah, I, storm. I know, exactly. I mean, it's just like when, yeah, people in the Southwest are like yawning at like, well, oh, I got 10th of an inch. Are you okay with my statement that it's a generational? I mean, are you there with me on that? Or like, or you think that's hyperbole? Well, I mean, statistically, Tucson had the wettest July on record. And that, that, that goes back to they pieced together that record since 1895. <laughs> so, and the, you know, the solid record from the airport from 1948 was, was crushed as well. That says something unusual has, has happened. Okay. So I'm going to say, I'm going to take that as a yes. You're, you're, you're in my camp. I just don't know what more uh, a monsoon could give than what it's given, not only in Tucson, which is where you and I are, but like, yeah. if you take, if you zoom out and you take the broad picture, I mean, the statewide precipitation ranks from NOAA for July, actually, Mike, you may know how they calculate this, but it's some spatial average of, of station data or interpolated data. And there's 127, they pieced together the record back to 127 years. This July was the second wettest. Second wettest, yeah. I mean, and that-, that I was actually like, surprised it wasn't the wettest. Yeah, and I think that that's because er, there have been corners of the state that haven't quite kept up. so. Southeast Arizona, really interesting. It's typically one of the wettest spots during the monsoon, you know, usually comes on early and is, is really persistent. And most of Southeast has done, but the very far corner has actually been kind of quiet. And I was looking at some data too. Southwest New Mexico, I was looking at the, the endemic New Mexico had a, had a pretty good rally early on, and it's been kind of slow over the last couple of weeks. And they're actually behind now as far as their monsoon total. But those little pockets of dry are pretty small relative to the expansive areas that have seen a, not just average, but like wild above average, two, three, four times what you should normally see this for this time of year, through this time of year. The one July that had more average Arizona precipitation was 1919. So should yeah. we even believe that? That's too far. I feel like that's too far back to, to count. Right. The station density was extremely low at that point. Noah has worked hard for that particular data set to try to make sure that it's that it's kind of homogenous over time. But again, yeah, it's not going to have the same resolution as anything kind of post 1930 and especially as you get into to later decades. So yeah, so it's probably got some uncertainty bars around it, even though they're not calculated. So you know it's it's possible that we're we're already the wettest or it's in contention for sure. Yeah, and it's just like the 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 station density that they're building this data set off is 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 lower than it is as you get later later on in the record. Uh, yeah, for the moment. Yeah, and 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 
for the monsoon season, that probably matters a lot more than, you know, it might in the winter. So yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's some studies, there's some historical studies around that period. It was really, really wet period in Arizona. And there's some kind of like um, uh, geological studies or studies about like arroyo cutting and large landslides and, and movement of sediment that are traced back to that particular year. So, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that there was, it was really wet and it moved water around quite a bit, but us being really close to that is we're starting to see those impacts all over the state. There's washes running almost continuously. These are like dry uh, washes that are now acting and behaving like rivers. Any little bit of precipitation is causing some flows. And, you know, we've, we've seen reports of some landslides and, you know, sort of movement of slumping of you know, hills and roads kind of getting washed away. Is it possible that I was hearing tree frogs the other night? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> no, it is. And so I, I took a recording. I went out one of the, the days that the Rito, the Rito um, flooded the first one in, in that July event. And it was, it was, it was a din of uh, frogs. They had all emerged at the same time. It was the craziest thing. I mean, my backyard looks like a salad bowl. It's incredible. It's oh, like, it- it's, it's not, we were joking that, um, we should start trying to grow coffee up in the, uh, the hills of, uh, Tucson. I mean, it's just astonishing since I've been here in 2008, right? So it's not that long. There's what, yeah. Like you said, there's washes that I had never seen run. Yeah. And, and driving down and just driving around this, this area and, you know, looking up at, you know, normally earthen colored mountains, they're entirely green. Can you remember, I mean, you remember eight weeks ago? You know, we'd come out of uh, 2020 with that completely non-existent monsoon, and then we had the La Nina winter. I mean, stuff was was either dead, barren, or suffering. And some stuff, like trees, you know, haven't quite you know turned around, which is to be expected. But everything else, like, has exploded into to growth. And there's this been a lot of reporting too about insects. I don't know if you've seen that, but like flies, moths, and mosquitoes are just everywhere and people are freaking out. No, I've, uh, I've experienced that firsthand. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> I'm going to, I'll take it though. I'm not going to complain about the mosquitoes. No, no, I'm not either. I mean, like this is, this is, this is part of, it's all evidence of a, a, a incredible monsoon season uh, unfolding in front of us right now. You know, we never, we sort of talk about the monsoon in a very sort of affectionate way. Um, obviously. And I think a lot of our listeners have that sort of relationship with it too, because I mean, there's so many amazing things about it from just the scenery to the fact that, you know, it, it, it sort of suppresses the fire season and um, gives much needed moisture to the landscape. But, you know, it, in, a, in a year like this, it's probably worth also mentioning that we, we are cognizant of the, the risks, you know, that uh, as you mentioned, right, like the next rainfall, I mean, we're, we're under flash flood watch probably you know, we'd have to have a prolonged period of dry out um, for, uh, for that not to be the case with, you know, just a sort of moderate amount of, uh, of rain. And so we're in this period now where because it, we've had such persistent um, uh, rain and the soils are saturated that just even a moderate uh, amount will, will cause the washes to, to run and, and, and flash flooding. So I, I guess I just wanted to say that because, you know, I've seen some particularly in Nogales, I've seen some, you know, Twitter videos of just horrendous, like horrendous uh, street flooding and people yeah. getting swept away and that sort of thing. And, and there are casualties. And then, you know, just the people that I interact with, like, have had damage to their homes and, and that sort of thing from it. So it's just, I guess it's important to, to make that note as a caveat that we sort of talk about it with such glee, but there is a, there is a, a sort of more uh, uh, darker color to, to this as well uh, that we want to be cognizant of. We have to have respect for this, right? I mean, this is, we don't see this every year, but the landscape tells the story that these kinds of events happen, right? I mean, you're, you're a geologist by training and, you know, you go hike any of these canyons and you look to see where some of these boulders were, you know, they clearly were from higher up the canyon and they have moved down. I mean, isn't this the kind of year that makes that kind of stuff happen? Yeah. I mean, it's so like, bringing back my geology. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I, I, I worked a lot in geomorphology and sort of the study of how the land surface evolves and these extreme events are the ones that carve the landscape up They're They're where you have like massive amounts of erosion. I mean, just think about like the slot canyons in 
in, in Utah and just, you know, they're, they're dry most of the time. And yet there's like hundred, 200 feet deep. And you're like, well, yeah. what actually creates this? It's a massive amount of water moving through in a short period of time. Yeah, that's totally. That's you know, I, there's that, there's a Canyon just outside of Tucson that we'll, we'll hike up. We've hiked it up for years <clears throat> up Tanka Verde Creek. And there's this beautiful polished stone way up high. And you're like, it never flows up there. There's no way. How would that even pop? You know, cause I'm thinking about my experience here and you're like, Oh, <laughs> it's years like this when the conditions come together and are just right that you can get these incredible flows out of persistent rainfall. Yes. Yeah, so you mentioned a minute ago, just um, how there are a number of areas around the Southwest that have experienced above average precipitation. I, I'm just looking at like, we have tabular data that shows the precipitation anomaly and they're just massive anomalies. The amount of precipitation above average, you look in Green Valley in South, Southeast Arizona or around us, you know, it's 10 inches anomaly. So 10 inches for this time of, in the monsoon season above average, that's an insane amount. Workman Creek, that is in the, Mike, help me out here. That's close to Flagstaff, right? Yes, I believe so. Anyway, it's up, it's up in the higher elevation, seven, seven inches of rain. Nogales, or sorry, seven inches above average. Nogales, six and a half. Tucson International Airport, close to six. Uh, Prescott, five and a half. Uh, Payson, five. The Ros, so this is both for Arizona and New Mexico. The Roswald area, Roswell, excuse me, area, four inches, close, a little bit more than four inches. Flagstaff, about four inches. I, I, on and on. Yeah, so the Phoenix Airport. Oh, the Phoenix Airport, unfortunately, uh, uh, well, it's above average, so it's not unfortunate, but um, about three quarters of an inch uh, above average. So not as much as other places, but this is, again, this is sort of a, a, a regional monsoon season, if you will. And that yeah. refle reflected in what, what I mentioned before, which is this is the second, as in Arizona as a whole, is the second wettest on, uh, on record. For sure. And I, you know, I think that there's, you know, some of those just subtle regional differences. Arizona has just sort of soared. And we're, you know, we're wet in places that we don't always see a ton of precipitation through the season. So like you said, Flagstaff, Prescott, down through central Arizona, southern Arizona, certainly Pima County, especially, has just been hammered by repeated activity. Some of that activity is actually pushed off into northwest Arizona. So you're seeing places like Kingman with uh, 150, 200 percent of average. And uh, Yuma and La Paz counties in far southwest have had a couple of epic days too, and are anywhere from three, four, six times their average precipitation. So it's just been, you know, crazy on how it hasn't necessarily stuck to the mountains. And it's, we've had a lot of events that have moved into the lower desert, which is, you know, you don't always see that every monsoon season. Yeah. And this has a feedback on temperature too. And uh, if you remember last year, we were, we were monitoring the number of days above a hundred and, you know, we were, on pace for record, which I think we ended up, yeah, last year was a record in Tucson, and I believe in Phoenix as well. So this year, obviously, when you have a bunch of moisture around, you have cloud cover around, you have evaporation, transpiration around, it's going to cool the, uh, cool the temperatures. We've had to date only 46 days in the calendar year of 100 degrees or, or above. Last year at this time in Tucson uh, was 73. So, you know, <laughs> that matters. Phoenix, we're, Phoenix is right around average at uh, about 75 days. And last year at this time, last year at this time was 90. So I think you see a little bit of the impact of climate change there too, is that I would think of as being as wet as it would be would suppress temperatures a lot below average, right? But the fact that the temps have gone up, all I can do is hold it to average now at this, this point in time. I looked up the 10 wettest monsoon seasons. This is not comparing apples to apples, so to speak, but, it, but the numbers are speak for themselves. If, if we were to say the monsoon, we'll get to this a little bit later, but if we were to say the monsoon was, was going to shut down now, we would be the 10th wettest monsoon on, on record. So if no more precipitation uh, came to the Tucson airport, it would be the 10th wettest monsoon season on record. So that just gives you an idea of how much rain is, has already happened. And then the nine seasons above uh, the nine monsoon seasons with more precipitation than, than, than this year, the average temperatures were all around between 82.5 uh, 
and 84.5. Our temperature so far, and I would think it would only get hotter as you go forward. Well, maybe it would, maybe it would, maybe it would drop a little bit because of September. But our temperature so far has been uh, close to 88 average temperature. So I, it's not comparing apples to apples, Mike, but I think that there's obviously a sort of a warming signal embedded with, within those numbers. And we can yeah. revisit these numbers at the end just to see you know, how, um, how much the temperature anomaly differs from, from other wet years. Yeah. You know, I was looking at some other stuff here too, and just thinking about the, the drought situation. We've seen the drought monitor map, as you'd expect, <laughs> starting to retreat a little bit. And I've been part of some of those discussions. We're you know, trying to carefully roll back the drought conditions, but, you know, really, honestly, the drought monitor map in Arizona, especially is really reflecting long-term drought conditions now and not short-term drought. I mean, we really effectively don't have short-term drought conditions effectively across the state. In Tucson, with this rally, um, looking at water year precipitation, so water, the water year runs October 1st through September 30th. So it's going to end at the end of the monsoon season, which, you know, we, our calendar date is September 30th. So Tucson is within striking distance of being average as far as the water year precipitation. So we went into the monsoon season um, about 10 inches in the hole. And, you know, I, I was, I think we joked about this is like, I mean, it could happen, but what are the chances, the, the probability there's even, you can calculate probabilities of this. They were less than 5%, you know, of us meeting water year average precipitation. You need yeah. a historically amazing monsoon, which is exactly. What we yeah. Yeah. You but need yeah, it. You would need this to happen. Yeah. Right. You just wouldn't bet on it. You know, no, you know? no. Given my uh, monsoon fantasy bets. <laughs> yeah. We'll get, we'll get to that. So another like amazing feature that I think defines this monsoon season is just the persistence of the water, uh, the moisture around the, yeah. the precipitable water. I mean, if you look at like dew point, is basically a measure of uh, atmospheric water content. I think there's been in at Tucson, there's been one day where the dew point was below its historical average, just one day, every single other day, it's been above average. Yeah. And, and, and in even that one day was above the sort of characteristic temperature where 54 degrees Fahrenheit, where monsoon storms typically generate. So it, it's e even at even that day, there was enough moisture around if you had other conditions uh, favorable that th there, there could have been storms. You look at precipitable, I'm looking at um, some reanalysis data, which is kind of coarse, backward looking model data here. Uh, and the precipitable water anomaly for the Southwest is, it's, as you would expect, <laughs> above average and, and quite a bit above average. And it's, it's even interesting, even Southern California has um, been way stickier than you'd expect to see for this period of the monsoon as well. So the, the, mon the, yeah, the moisture has flowed up the Gulf, has kind of flooded the desert Southwest, and there's been a good connection to moisture to the East as well. So New Mexico has been in it as well. And it's just stuck around. We just haven't had any problem with, you know, troughs to the North reaching far enough down here to kind of shift the wind direction out of the Southwest or the West to scour it out and move it out of the region. It's just been stuck here. Any little passing troughs like were hugely problematic last summer. They've been far enough North that they haven't caused any trouble at all. Yeah. I always want to know why. Right. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so it, we're talking about the, the, the favorable ridge position. And when it's to our North, it sort of allows that seeped uh, of, of moisture in, in from our South. And it's been, we talked about this uh, last month. It's just been persistently in a favorable position and it hasn't had anything. I think what you're saying is it, it hasn't had anything to its North, uh, these, tro these troughs moving in that has sort of pushed it, pushed it to the South, right? But that sort of implies that there is, that the pushing mechanism is, it, it is what knocks it out of place. But there's probably also some sort of forcing from the south that's pushing it to the north, right? It's weak, right? So the tropics are weak circulation wise. Uh, you know, they're strong with hurricanes and, and those kinds of things, but global hemispheric circulation is driven by that temperature gradient. And so that temperature gradient is constricted to the poles. And so we were chatting about this on Slack um, last month and <clears throat> just noting how, you know, one of the measurements, we talk about this in the winter and we never talk about it in the summer because it's usually not um, that. Uh, applicable, 
but like a measurement like the Arctic oscillation, which is going to give us an indication of whether or not you've got sort of constrained cold air trapped around the poles. And the edge of that trapped cold air is going to be the edge of the jet stream. Well, it was interesting that last summer it was kind of it kind of flopped out and was that cold air, it wasn't contained to the northern hemisphere. And so we had a wavy jet that persisted across the whole globe. Part of that wavy jet um, was battering the subtropical high, our Four Corners Ridge, and just kind of moved it all over the place and pushed it south. And we never could set up for any length of time to actually move the moisture in and get into deep easterly flow. And then we were out of the season before we were even in it. The opposite has been true this year is that it's been really tight. The wave pattern has been really constrained to higher latitudes. So that's left us with, you know, real um, broad high pressure system over the West and has kept the circulation to the north of us. And so it's kept us on the south side of the high in, in sometimes strong easterly flow, sometimes weak, but it hasn't kind of mattered um, because, you know, both have been good to kind of leave the moisture here and not move it out of the, out of the region. But let's say, let's say that the jet stream is not, is not acting like it was last year. It uh, isn't, right. No, no, I'm, I'm coming up with the scenario. I'm, I'm trying to think like, if you had a jet stream that wasn't sort of thumping on the, the high pressure ridge. So it was, it was, it, it was allowing the, the movement of that high to, you know, further north, right? Like, I guess my question is, would it always move if it didn't have that sort of pushing and the thumping of the jet stream? Would it always move to like its like highly favorable position that it's that it's been in this year, or would it just not move as far north? Like I'm wondering if like for some reason like it's it's just further north for 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 reasons that also have to do with what's going on in the south, or or, or does that not make sense? I've tried to figure this out over the years too, of like dynamically what is that mid level ridge, and it's it's partially related to global hemispheric flow, flow and, and partially related to land surface feedbacks too, right? I mean, part of it is, is that the West has a lot of elevated topography, has really deep boundary layers that emerge from that and cause, you know, a sort of a swelling of the atmosphere here with that, that is an expression in that ridge position. And so it's clearly more complicated than that and has all these sort of daily dynamic feedbacks with you know, where it's raining and where there's clusters of thunderstorms popping up and what's going on upstream as far as the wave patterns and even what's going on as far as wave patterns all the way back across the West Pacific to typhoon activity and even the, the East Asian monsoon activity can, can uh, impact the downstream wave pattern. So there's all that kind of complexity, which I think is why, why the monsoon prediction becomes so challenging. And then if we do get into a situation like this, where this broad expanse of high is sort of set up across the West, and this is, you know, kind of leading into our discussion about what has happened, is that you can then have, um, we call inverted troughs, or these upper level low pressure systems that are kind of coming across the top of the ridge. They can, they can dive down through the Great Plains, and sometimes they can get entrained and pulled back towards the West. And that's indeed what we've seen. We saw with the, um, the big multi-day July event, and it's even what's happening right now as another inverted trough that's moving from East to West across the Southwest right now. So that's a good segue, because I want to dive into that um, late July, I think it was July 22nd, 25th um, event that for Tucson, it like dropped over a four day period, something like six inches of rain. And it, 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 it accounts for a large fraction of um, the rainfall totals for, for much of the Southwest. So Mike, give us a little, give us a little sort of event diagnosis. There's a really great report that Paul Iniguez from the National Weather Service up in Phoenix pulled together. And um, we'll post it in the, I think the show notes, we send this out but it's got a great detailed zoom in on Phoenix, but it kind of extends to the rest of the area. And there's some great visuals and animations there that talk about um, what had happened there. And so again, it's just what we've been talking about is having the high pressure system to the North allows activity from the East, cyclonic activity. So any kind of low pressure system, an inverted trough is probably a better, better term for it uh, to move in from the east and towards the, towards the west. And so what that does for 
the Southwest is it can lessen the need for topography to drive a lot of the convection because it's going to create more favorable lapse rates. So the ability to create that convective instability over larger areas and um, lift the air, which is kind of part of this mechanism as well. So you, instead of getting these tiny little thunderstorms or even kind of lines of thunderstorms that are emerging out of elevation and maybe they've got good steering flow, you get all the above. You get good steering flow, you get good lapse rates, you get some lifting broad areas, which will enhance widespread moderate to heavy rain. And we saw that and we saw those turn into, we call it mesoscale convective vortices. So they become their own little low pressure systems, their own little weather features that can then kind of wander around because underneath the high pressure system, there's not strong flow and they can, they can wander around for days. And so you can end up having new convection start the next day if the moisture is available and the instability is there. So we, we saw waves of it. Like, I think there were three or four different waves of this activity that emerged over and around Arizona. Yeah. So a couple of things I remember first, it was so interesting because it felt like winter rain. Yes. Without, without the, the, the cool temperatures. I mean, it wasn't warm. It wasn't hot. Rather. Yep. But it would, they were almost like all day events. And they were. Yeah. They were, they were, mul- there were many out and they were, there was the later events were, had very little lightning. They were broad kind of lifting mechanisms, not necessarily super convective had really, I remember that Sunday of that event, it was about 66 degrees in Tucson at noon, which I thought we were going to break the record for the lowest high temperature in Tucson in July ever. It did warm up to 77 and it, it was still near record low high temperature for that day. But that was the same thing. I mean, I, we went out and watched the Pantano wash flow, which is normally nothing. It's just a, just a dry riverbed, but it was running bank to bank. The clouds were so low on the mountains, which is evidence of how much moisture there was in it. And it was so cool. So it's like kind of those two things of like having clouds that low in the summertime is really hard to do in the hot desert Southwest. Yeah. And I remember um, there was a certain, at least in our circles where, you know, a lot of us like, you know, constantly paying attention and there was this certain excitement. It doesn't happen all that often, right? Like for a weather event, like, I mean, obviously we, we pay attention every day to the, during the monsoon, but this, this period, the anticipation of it, where people were talking about, you know, 2006, which had similar kind of synoptics, similar kind of regional pattern and this inverted trough in 2006. And I believe that was the year I wasn't here then, but I remember being up in Colorado and having actually somebody from Tucson come out to our geology department. But I think that was the year that there was all these landslides from the event in 2006 on, on, on Mount Lemmon that you can still see the, the landslide scars. Yep. Uh, yep. On the, and so there was, is that right? Is that, the, oh, yeah, that was that, the event, right? that's right. And it was the timing of it was, it was the very, I remember this, it was the very end of July. It was like right on the 31st into August 1st. And it was, it, I remember this, it reminded me a lot because the, all of the heavy rain was happening at night. It was like the middle of the night and it was, I hadn't lived in Tucson for that long. And my experience was, it was, you know, heat of the day, storms form late afternoon. They're completely exhausted by sundown and then it clears out. Right. I mean, that's kind of the normal diurnal convection. So to get something that have deep, heavy convection overnight, you have to have something else going on because you've lost the sun's energy at that point. So there's got to be other instability to exhaust it. And that event ended up having a lot of very heavy, somewhat isolated at that point, rainers for multiple days over a kind of a small watershed. And it had the burn scar on it from 2002. So it did. And that was the concern going into the the July event. We thought we were going to repeat that. But I think what ended up happening was that the rain amounts were, were crazy, but they were over such a long period of time. You didn't have those, those individual watersheds try to move a bunch of water all at once. But what you did see was those watersheds all contributed to main, like really high main stem flows on some of the rivers and washes. And so they, they popped right up and ran for days. Yeah. And the other thing about this event was that there was just a ton of water around prior to it. So, you know, if, if like in, in theory, like, 
this sort of a, a weather system pattern could have set up last year, right? But it might have been, it would have generated rain, but it might not have generated as much because this year we, we there, like like we mentioned before, the the amount of water in the atmosphere that has just hung around, it's just been high the entire time. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. I'm I'm trying to think of like, could you have gotten a really good strong, deep inverted trough? move across the region without having the associates because they kind of go together, right? I mean, for to get an event like this, the high has got to be in a good spot. I suppose you could have had a weak surge or a non-existent surge, but they kind of, they all kind of connect together. Last year would have, it just wouldn't have been impossible because the, we, well, we didn't have the moisture, but we also, the ridge position was so terrible. Like anything, those inverted troughs were deep down into Mexico because of the, the whole subtropical ridge position. Right, but what I, what I was thinking is, is in theory, at least, it, it, it was possible at any point during last year's monsoon for the ridge to actually move into a more favorable position and, and thus have a, the, the possibility of this inverted trough, right? It, I think if the ridge would have moved into a good position, we would have seen a, a, a concurrent increase in low-level moisture. Like, I think, I think that that, that kind of connects together. Was there sort of a, a, an amplification because the, pers- the the moisture had been more persistent? Oh, I see what you're saying. Year. Yeah, that's probably right. That's probably right. I think you know you can you can turn it around pretty quick. I think if last year you know by chance it kind of got its act together and you had a big you you could have had a surge set up in a couple of days and then have this easterly wave kind of come across. And one of the big differences too is that it had rained. We had some decent rain before this event in July. So this event kind of came into some already worked over um, soil moisture. So soil moisture was already sort of jumping up. So like on the flash flood side, it wasn't starting from zero and then like ramping up. It was like already, the monsoon had already kind of set up even in, in the beginning of the month and we were seeing heavy rain. And then that event happened and then it was interesting. We, we saw the whole high pressure system kind of reorganized and move around. It was less favorable kind of the first week of August. So like last week. And that was, that was when you saw that one day in Tucson, Zach, where the dew point dropped down, Mm -hmm. we got into some brief Southwesterly flow aloft and we did see a dry out. We saw that kind of retreat. I thought that was it. (laughs) I thought like, okay, we're, we're not going to get anything more. And that's mostly, that wasn't rational. That was irrational because (laughs) Cause I thought, okay, you can't, you can't do this again, but the high has continued to be in a great spot and we're now in a deep easterly flow. And we're looking at another inverted trough moving across that is somewhat similar, probably not going to create as much rain, at least here. I think it's actually going to clobber Southwest New Mexico, which as we talked about earlier has been really dry this monsoon. So, you know, Deming, which is now below average for the monsoon might have a super quick catch up and get a couple inches of rain. And, um, you know, we'll see even more evening out of all this precipitation as we move through the monsoon season. And given that it's Friday, that event will transpire before people are listening to this pod. Yes. Thank you. That's right. So it'll be interesting to see how it actually plays out. Cause I did, I did the, the podcast no, no of, um, referring to real time. Okay, so just a quick, quick thing on that. So these inverted troughs are not uncommon, right? Like, no. and so maybe you've already hit on this, but what, what was so odd about, um, odd it's not the right word, uncommon about the, this, uh, the, the, the July 22nd, 25th event? You know, I mean, if the analog was only 2006, you know, 15 years ago. So these are, you know, there aren't many analogs for what happened. So what was the sort of um, uncommon about this event? Yeah, I think what stuck out to me, there's some great papers done by some U of A colleagues, uh, some of Chris Castro's grad students, and there's some other people in our hydrology and atmospheric science department who have done climatologies of inverted troughs. And you see a lot of inverted trough activity to the south of us, kind of through northern Mexico. This, this one was... Um, it was almost like a closed mid-level, upper-level low. It was, it was indeed an inverted trough. It had this really nice kind of swirl to it. And again, you can see this on some animations um, that we'll post in the, the podcast. 
but it, it was pretty far North, right? I mean, it was, it was, it came out of a trough that was diving South out of the great plains. And it came across, um, kind of Eastern New Mexico and moved towards the Southwest. And it, the track of it had a forecast that didn't quite pan out because these features are so they're slow moving and kind of amorphous. They don't have a lot of drive to them, especially if they're kind of coming back towards the West. And it very slowly moved from like Northern New Mexico and fired up a bunch of activity there. And then you started to see little meso scale convective vortices rotate around it, which then became the forcing features for subsequent rounds of precipitation. And then it kind of gradually wandered over Arizona and then it eventually kind of filled in and then moved off towards the, the Southwest. But, you know, it's, it was sort of a square on hit to New Mexico and Arizona. And I, you know, that to me struck out. And again, it was because that um, ridge was in such a good spot. It wasn't shunted to the South and we didn't get kind of get the sloppy leftovers of it flowing to the North. We were like in it, which we're not always in. That event and basically the entire monsoon has like every single monsoon, like I, I start thinking about it slightly differently. Like it, it offers this, uh, this opportunity to really like question what you know about the monsoon and, and, and how you're thinking about the monsoon. So uh, Mike, I don't, I don't know if you've, uh, you've had new thoughts this year, if new things that you're thinking about or, or, or or events that make you question what you think you knew. Uh, but let me just throw out a couple of the things that I've been thinking about and feel free to just riff off them if you have, if you, if you have further, further ideas about them. But I'm still sort of trying to work my way through them and hopefully more will come up in the second half. But so one, the first thing is, is just the role of these transient features like the inverted troughs that we talked about, but also, also uh, remnant hurricanes or remnant tropical storms rather uh, into the region that the role of these remnant or these transient features in uh, the spatial patterns of, of precipitation, like how how important are they? How much do they contribute to the overall mon uh, monsoon season? So that's one, the role of the transient features. The second one I just think is funny, uh, not funny, but interesting paying attention to Twitter, like the discourse of the monsoon, like how people think about and how people talk about the monsoon. I mean, last year it was like, it was so depressing and, and, and this year it's been quite the opposite, but having them back to back, like people have used words like whiplash and, and that sort of thing. So we're, we're talking about the monsoon in, in, in a different way. And, 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 and we had back to back extreme monsoons. And so that, that sort of has uh, meshed up with the, the sort of climate change narrative. So I find that really interesting. A third thing is what's the role of, of June in the June temperature in setting the stage for, for, for July's precipitation. Um, I think that's been a, a, a question that I've seen come, come, come across and made me wonder because we had a pretty, pretty warm June, I believe this year. And then the one that I I'm always thinking about uh, is just the role of climate change uh, in this. And, you know, it's, I can't wrap my head around which way it can go. I mean, I, climate change can can do both things it can you know overall increase it could lead to an increase in the monsoon it could lead to a decrease there could be no change because the variability is so high it could lead to an increase in year to year variability much like what what we've seen from last year to this year you know and then of course there's all of this like intra seasonal characteristics that also could change like the frequency intensity of storms and and even like shifts in the spatial distribution like is southeast or Southwest um, New Mexico, you know, become in a warmer climate, uh, unfavorable to, you know, other places. So all of these sort of nuances relate to, to climate change. So those are the, those are the four big questions that, I, that I've been thinking about. What about you? Do you no, have any they, comments on, on, on those? Yeah, no, it's, it's, ex it's exactly where I've been coming into. And I'm getting a lot of questions on the climate change aspect and the idea of you know, going from one extreme to the next, is that, is that evidence or not? And I mean, I just don't, I don't know. Right. I mean, and I think that we need to have a little stronger tie to the, the paleo record and take a little closer look at that as far as monsoon precipitation variability as best we can kind of tease that out and try to understand if we're indeed seeing more variability now than we've 
seen in the past. The idea that the variability from one summer to the next is climate change, I think is, again, the way I think about it too is like climate change is part of everything. Now it's just a matter of how, what's its attribution? Like how much is it a part of it, right? And so the IPCC report out this week had some pretty broad brush literature reviews of like Western North America changes in precipitation. And they're, they're, it's a real mixed bag and it's even rated as sort of a low confidence. And, and we know that from the literature as well, is that for the monsoon season in the Southwest, there's a couple of survey papers out right now that are, the uncertainty is really high. And I think it has a lot to do with what we've talked about is that, you know, a wet season can emerge from a lot of sort of small scale, very small scale temporal events that kind of stack up on each other and give you a certain kind of flavor of monsoon. I, I'm always still kind of coming back to first order about this ridge position and um, thinking more about that, about like, can we see that over time? There's, there's uh, a couple of different papers, like there's one by Lammers, which is one of Chris Castro's grad students that uh, is suggesting that the subtropical ridge is actually expanding over time and getting bigger, which would then shunt inverted trough activity to the south. And so that that could be an explanation for trends in monsoon. But if you look at the monsoon precip trends, they're not there. Like you don't see any trends here. You see short, a lot of short-term variability. And so, and we know from the broad climate change research and atmospheric research is that you know, for every degree of warming, you see about a 7% increase in atmospheric humidity. So there is indeed more moisture in the atmosphere now than there was in the past, but that doesn't guarantee it's coming out <laughs> in every storm, right? So there's, there's just so many questions and, and I think unknowns that are going to, they're going to be long-term challenges. And I think what we'll see in the short term from season to season to season is kind of anything's possible, right? I mean, just in two years, we saw the worst thing I've ever seen as far as monsoon, and it was in the record, right? And, you know, one of the craziest, best ones in mind, and these are all value judgments, right? So next summer, I have no idea. All I can do is I go back to central tendency and like, well, most likely thing to happen is something closer to the average. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. It is kind of amazing that we've basically gone from worst to to best or lowest to highest rather. Um, yeah, right. We're close, close to, I mean, that, that, that those swings are, yeah, I guess we're lucky in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a sense because just based on the statistics, you, that's highly unlikely to happen. Yeah, I mean, and, and as like climate researchers, this gives us really useful, important, potentially bookends for us to look at. I mean, you know, and you know, it's like the, pro the, pro the climate projections they give us a lot of different answers and it's hard to know which one is right. And you average them together, you kind of get no change. You just have a really noisy signal, which is kind of what you and I talk about every summer is like, wow, this one was a little bit different than the last one, which was a little bit different than the last one, so on and so forth. It's got kind of general features that hang together, but a lot of little subtle things that would be impossible to see kind of going forward. You know, the change in atmospheric moisture, I think, is really important for us to kind of keep in mind as we go forward. And so it's not unreasonable to think about more extremes. And maybe we're already even seeing those right now. But I, I think that the attribution is probably really quite low at this moment. Yeah. And I, I think the right way to go is to think about these in terms of like driving mechanisms and sort of regional patterns, as opposed to actually trying to parse this question out by looking at data. Um, yeah. Because... Um, it's a highly variable system. And just like, you know, just statistics, it's like much harder to, to detect the signal from the noise in these highly variable systems. So it might be a long time before you can actually do that. And we don't have, and, and particularly when it's not just a temporal change that we have to pay attention to, but it's also a spatial change that yeah. we have to pay attention to. So that, that, that's an even more complicated, because uh, yeah, it might, there might be a change over here, but not over there. And then what, what does that actually mean? Um, and, 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 and so with that, I, 
yeah, I think it's th the right approach is to think about this in terms of theory and, and what we may expect uh, and not rule out possibilities based on, uh, on the data. Because as, as you and I have looked at and Ben as well, just like drawing on the station data that we have, which a lot of it doesn't have very long records, like yeah. you can't really find trends. Yeah, um, you know, and let me just tag on this point because this is this reminded me of something else I was thinking about um, with your points is detection and attribution of like precip change with the monsoon is really really hard and just as you pointed out we don't have real long records we also don't have station densities and the right kind of equipment to actually detect a lot of these changes because of the the kind of the character and nature of heavy precipitation events and complex topography and isolated nature. And, you know, I was thinking about, we've been looking at like home weather station data and volunteer observer networks. Like I run rain log and we had a couple of events over the last couple of days that were completely outside of the July 21st to 26th event. We had a, an isolated event in the Northeast corner in Tucson that um, dropped about three and a half inches of rain, which is half the monsoon total. If you're using the airport it's in a couple of bananas. Yeah. In a couple of hours, but it was just in the corner and we had several observers with good, good records, good gauges report in and the flood control network gauges showed us the same thing. So we had, you know, it was convergence of evidence on it and it didn't happen at the airport. Right. And it didn't happen near any of the long-term observing sites. And then the following week, this was just a couple of days here. I had four and a quarter inches in 24 hours at my house outside of the airport. The airport didn't get anywhere near that. Right. And so I don't, I mean, are these new extremes? Are they, are they within the range of variability? We don't even, we can't know, right? Because there's only so many gymnastics we can do with a sparse network of older data. We don't even have enough really good monitoring to be able to detect some of the changes we probably want to see. Right. So that's long-term change. I'm going to ask a question that uh, I was listening to you on NPR last night. And I think you got something like a question, like, well, what do you think the monsoon going to be like next year? How do you, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to ask that question to you. What's your, what was your answer? I, I just like waffled and bumbled through something and then basically said, I don't know. How could you? Well, exactly. I mean, it was, I even told him, he's like, well, I'm a climatologist. So I'll say something close to the average, which is like, <laughs> it's like a no forecast at that point. I mean, it, it kind of is a forecast because when you don't have anything else to go on, you use climatology. So I was thinking as I was listening, I was like, I always like to remind myself, I, and we we do this every year, and we did a little bit of it last last episode. But I just like to remind myself of like how complex the the monsoon is. And so let me just go through this quick unpacking of some of the main contributors to the monsoon, just to just to think about like the the the, the forecasting problem at hand you know, the seasonal and, and, and yearly forecasting problem. And, you know, it, it's a question that everybody wants to know, hence they asked it, you know, we, 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 we all want to know what the monsoon. In fact, we were asking people in the monsoon fantasy forecast game, what they think about it. So uh, we want, we want to know what other people think about it. So anyway, right. So you gotta, you have to start with moisture. I mean, if there's no moisture around, just forget about it. Right, like zero moisture, you're not getting a you're not getting monsoon rain. But if you have moisture around, you have the potential. But it also doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get rain. So there's other there's other important factors. But mon uh, moisture is has primacy. And then to me, it's like okay, so you've got a couple other questions, which are well, what affects the presence of of that moisture around that sloshing in the in the southwest, right? So just the pre presence of it. And then what affects whether or not that that moisture actually falls in space and in time, right? And we've talked about some of the, the main drivers being like, obviously the position of the ridge is, is, is critical because that largely controls whether or not we have moisture moving in from, from, from the south. And then an another key variable is, is, is just the wind pattern, the wind profile, the atmospheric wind profile. Like if we had, if we just have weak winds and we have moisture around, we're largely going to relegate the storms that do form just to the to the topography and not blow them into the desert. So the the steering winds matter for sort of pushing those uh, those storms off into the desert and creating more widespread events. You know, another thing is is just the instability of the atmosphere. Uh, and you were talking about that 
uh, earlier when we were, we were talking about the July 22nd, 20, 25th event where, you know, the normally, normally how we think of the monsoon, it's like, it's the sun is, is, is heating up the earth, which is driving the moisture to convect to, to, to rise and that rising moist air is, is, is being squeezed like, like a sponge, but there's atmospheric instability would, would be a measure of how much uh, that air can, or how easy that air, 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 air can rise. And, and, and so that's really important. And, and atmospheric instability can be generated through a number of different ways. And then you've got things like the, the formation and the tracks of these Pacific storms and, and, and other sort of transient weather features like these inverted, inverted troughs. And then on top of that, you've got these land surface feedbacks like soil moisture and evaporation. And, and, and that's sort of interesting, both on a seasonal and, 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 and sort of interseasonal level, like rain on one day can, can, can cause soil moisture to increase and, and, and evaporation to cool the, the, the surface for the next day. And it really helps sort of shunt the ability of that, uh, of that convection for the next day. So it can work on a work as a break in, in one respect, but then it's also like producing a bunch of humidity around that can then be recycled and, and regenerated into, into storm. So it works on that level too. In addition to these, another feedback, which is relates to these transient weather features are these mesoscale convective systems or mesoscale convective vortices that, that, that you mentioned before. You know, and then on top of that, we've got these sort of marginal teleconnected effects like ENSO, that uh, El Nino Southern os Oscillation, which relates to sort of the presence of tropical storms, which I mentioned before, but also there's some weak evidence that it can influence land surface feedbacks and influence the timing of the, uh, of the onset of the monsoon. So that's like a super quick way. I don't know, Mike, you can, if you want to add to it. I mean, I think that was pretty exhaustive. And I, and the interesting thing is they're all, they're all related to each other in various ways. And they evolve, like the beginning of the season has different things to look forward to. You know, like I think ridge position is more important at the beginning of the season than it, and it, it wanes and moves towards the end of the season. And you get more into sort of transition flow because that um, ridge is kind of moving back to the South and then the, the specific kind of comes online. So there's, there's this kind of like progression through the season of the importance of some of these things too. And the, the character and nature of the monsoon evolves from the beginning to the end as well. Cause the sun angle is changing through this whole period as well. Yeah. It's a, it's a really complicated pro uh, problem. And then, and then you ask yourself, well, where, where do we like have some predictive ability within those, those variables you know, and it's at the seasonal level and it's few and far between. I mean, maybe there's, there's some with ENSO, but it, ENSO's effect on the monsoon is sort of weak and, and, and it's tropical, it's effect on tropical storm. Like, I mean, I mean, it's there, but whether or not the tracks move into the Southwest is, is, is uncertain. So there's just not a lot of predictive ability with at the seasonal scale to predict the monsoon. And, 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 and so we're, we're sort of, grasping at, 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 at the margins a little bit, hedging just slightly one way or the other, um, but, but not a lot of confidence. And it's reflected always, uh, not always, but mostly in the official NOAA forecasts at the seasonal level, which just sort of, if there is a forecast, if it's not just like flipping a coin, uh, which, which I, that happens uh, mostly, but if they do hedge one way or the other, it's only slightly. Well, it was interesting this year too that the National Multimodal Ensemble, one well, the International Multimodal Ensemble, which is <clears throat> some U.S. but also international climate forecasting tools, and so they. Yeah. So, anyways, these are the kind of the gold standards. They there was a huge like tangle of mixed signal, and those forecasts actually leaned dry for months, right up until the monsoon season, and they even leaned dry for this month in August. And they're not really panning out. I think that they're, they might have panned out in kind of the periphery of the region, but just a couple of these events centered on central southern Arizona kind of blew them away. And again, like how would they see any of this stuff? Right. With all of that undermining this, this next segment, one should say that, right, as you get the closer to present, your ability to predict in general goes up. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, when we think about, okay, well, what's the rest of August going to do, Mike, what, what, what's your thoughts? You think we're going to keep up this, this overdrive monsoon overdrive? 
Well, we typically have bursts and breaks, right? <laughs> That's kind of the, the, the typical thing is that you get this sort of enhancement, you get a wild activity, and then the ridge position sort of resettles, kind of moves around. Maybe you get into a dry period. Doesn't doesn't happen necessarily with regularity. We did sort of see that between July's event, beginning of, of August, and now we're, we're sort of back into it. The outlooks have been a pretty mixed bag going forward. And, and again, because we're we're transitioning, stuff starts to tail off as you get into later into August. And you you had typically have trouble kind of holding on to the ridge position much through the end of August and especially into September, that changes. And you should sort of shift over. Usually the ridge kind of moves off to the east and we get in between a trough setting up off the west coast and the ridge to the east. And that usually puts us into south southerly flow. And it can be real subtle. If it's southwesterly, we dry out. If it's southerly, southeasterly, we can open up the Gulf of California and bring moisture in. The week three, four uh, outlook, this issue today on Friday, August 13th, is the same forecast they've had for several weeks now, which is above average, a shift in odds towards above average precip for all of Arizona and most of New Mexico. So they kind of, and they say in their their discussion is like, it looks like the monsoon pattern is in good shape. The shorter term outlooks have kind of wet through next week, maybe a break the following week, and then maybe we pick back up. So it should be kind of up and down. But again, I don't, I don't really know The the East Pacific is getting more busy. Tropical storms could be more, I mean, they already are. Part of the reason we were in the soup again today is because we had a couple of close brushes from hurricanes down at the mouth of the Gulf of California. So, you know, it's the middle of August. And so maybe we got a couple more weeks left in us. Unless that tropical storm activity is a big player in September, though, we're, we're usually kind of kind of shutting things down and the game is usually over by the middle part of September, unless those storms are more of a player. At this point, halfway through the monsoon, we're past peak monsoon, right? Like most of the, like if you look at the precipital water, um, that sort of peaks around August 1st. So we're past peak monsoon. But at this stage, I think the record's in play. Right. Like I think the record is in place, statewide record is in play for the entire monsoon season. And then if we just zoom in on Tucson, right? Like right now, if the if the monsoon shut down, if it, it if it turned to June for the next you know month and a half, but we'd still be the 10th wettest. And so we're at nine. So just to give some numbers to this, we're we're at 9.2 inches at the airport, and the record at the airport is 13.9 inches. And that's 1964, which was aided by a tropical storm. At least it seemed like it was aided because it happened in, in mid-September. So it was aided by a tropical storm, likely in, in, in 64. So 13.9. The second, the, 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 the second highest value is 13.1 in 1955, right? So if we were to just have like average for the remainder of August and September, like I think we catapult up to the fourth. You're right. So just just an average performing monsoon puts us up into that top five. Right. So I'm not betting that the airport uh, is 13.9, <laughs> but it's in play, and we don't we can't say that very often. It's in play, Mike. No, no, I I totally agree with you. Yeah, I mean, and again, it's like I had like, so Friday the 13th. We're looking at we're in a flash flood watch. We're gonna do this like flash flood watch type situation no more times after this weekend or two more times, right? I mean, who knows? I mean, if this pattern kind of sets up, I mean, it leaves an inverted trough event later in this month completely or a tropical storm kind of wandering up the Gulf. I mean, that's not far-fetched and it's the timing is perfect for August, later in August. And so, you know, a persistence forecast is often kind of useful. So do you want to take your, so now I want to talk just in the last five minutes we wrap this up. I want to talk about the monsoon fantasy, which is a game that a lot of people are playing where they get to uh, project what they think the, the upcoming month's precipitation will be like. So Mike, what was your August forecast like? What did you go? Did you lean? Did you lean one way or the other? You know me, I mean, I, I, I think I stuck with the median again for like all the, all the stations. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even remember. I've got to go look it up. I actually went dry and I, I, I'm lamenting this. I went dry on uh, across the board on all the cities on Tucson, Phoenix, Flagstaff, El Paso and, and Albuquerque. And so I bet, uh, for example, at El Paso, I was 
I thought the total August rainfall would be three quarters of an inch. It's already been an inch and a half. Flagstaff, I thought it was going to be around nine tenths of an inch. It's already been 1.8 inches. I'm lamenting my forecast, but I do, do, do want to also say that last month we had, we had no one score any points for Tucson. Zero. Everybody got a big goose egg for Tucson, which, you know, we had something like 250 people make, 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 make forecasts and, 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 and none of, no, none of them, no one was, was within a standard deviation. I mean, it's, I think that speaks to how, how much that has bucked what, what, what we all expected. But I mean, you think about that, like if somebody went in in June and put in 10 inches for, for Tucson, that would deserve ridicule. <laughs> yeah, they would have been, yeah, because, you know, that's just highly unlikely. I mean, or, it's, gonna, or it's witchcraft. I mean, isn't that like black magic at that point? I mean, you're like, wait a minute, what's what's going on here? Yeah, I don't so, think the slider even let you go that far. That's actually. right. I think you were right. I, I think, think it was it was limited. <laughs> I, I want to also say that the the like so people's total scores, so summing up their their points from the five from the five cities, like we're we're all fairly low. But the two people that scored the most didn't actually follow up and make estimates for August, which, which is good for the rest of us because, you know, there's a couple good, good, you know, high value weather stations that, at, at uh. <laughs> but I'd also encourage those people to uh, revisit it because you only have to play two months. And uh, uh, if you play in September, you, you, you could, uh, you could still come out on top, top two places. So. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. And I'll just make this note because you get points based on the riskiness of your forecast and, and, and your accuracy. I, I was sort of hedging toward the, uh, I just could, didn't think that the, the monsoon could keep it up. And so I was hedging toward dry and my potential points for August, if, it, if the, uh, the monsoon shuts down right now and I score what my potential points say that I'll score, I'll be number one. Shame on <laughs> you for cursing the monsoon, Zach. It's not going to happen too, because this weekend's going to, going to trash my estimates. I think. No, it's interesting because I was looking at some of the, the models. There's a little donut hole around the, the airport, <laughs> at least for Tucson. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right, Mike. Wow. Like this has been really fun. We probably could have talked uh, another half an hour. I got like a, a list of things we didn't cover that we can cover next, next month, but then... I know we, we're just going to bask in the glory of monsoon 2021 next month and just kind of gold medal performance out of it, even, even I'll, not being done. I'll just end it by saying I, this is a monsoon that came to you. That's, that's how I've been describing it. That's right? wonderful. Yep. You're right you, you on. Just sit, you just sit there and the monsoons all around you. And, and, and most years you, there's a storm somewhere else that you've got to, you've got to go visit to see the monsoon. Like, yeah, I mean, it, it's crazy in Tucson. There's nobody complaining about their corner of town. It's like kind of moved all over the place. And I think you can see that across a lot of the state too. And a lot of the Southwest. I mean, there's a couple of places that I think are going to catch up as we move through the next couple of weeks. So it'll even it out even more. All right. Well, I'm excited to, to come back in September and uh, see, see where we've been. So everybody, thanks for tuning in and uh, enjoy this, this season. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a generational monsoon. That's right. Thanks, Zach. Bye-bye. Okay, we ready to rock? Let's do it. Good, you're on a podcast. <laughs> Hi guys.